Amen. Thank you, choir. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn with me to the book of Joshua. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 14. If you see on your bulletin, we're going to be looking at Joshua chapter 22. So as I was told up here a while ago, I like to talk a lot. Uh, I have a lot to cover today. Now, we're not going to look at all these passages here, but I just want to briefly go through some passages here in Joshua chapter 14 as we go back to our, our study from just a couple of weeks ago. And we're going to look at just, I uh, want to make some comments about this, and then we're going to look at the first nine verses or so of the book of Joshua chapter 22. And uh, we look at a passage today as we're going to see the results of keeping a promise. And, uh, you know, I ask you today, as I, if you listened when I prayed, I hope you know today, folks, and I ask you today, do you believe God is faithful? Say amen. amen. Do you believe God keeps all his promises? Say amen. amen. And do you believe God does exactly what he says he's going to do? Say amen. amen. Now, we believe that, and we always believe that, and we believe that, and we hear that Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. But do we truly believe that in all of our heart and all of our minds and all of our soul and all of our strength? And we believe that without a doubt. And when something comes up that's tough or that's dangerous or we go through a tough time, are we going to hold to that? And we're going to say, God, you're always faithful. And God, you're always keeping your promises. And God, you always do exactly what you say you're going to do. And I can trust that. And I can believe God. And I can take that to the bank. And I can trust God no matter what happens in my life. God is going to be faithful, God's going to keep his promises, and God's going to be there with me and for me. Do we always realize that? Well, I'm here to tell you today, we're going to look at a passage here in just a moment in Joshua chapter 22. We're going to see that two and a half tribes, they keep their promise, and we're going to see they're going to be rewarded for their faithful service and their obedience to God. And I think we can apply that to our lives today, that when we are obedient to God, that we are faithful to God, that God is faithful to us. Even when we are unfaithful to God, he's always faithful to us. That's who he is. That's an attribute. That's a characteristic of God. He's never unfaithful. He's never untrusting. He's never unloving. He's never non-compassionate. That does not describe God. And so we're here today to realize today, as already been sung about, already been prayed about, that God is a great God, a God that we can count on, a God that we can believe in, a God that we can trust, and a God we can have faith in. Now, if you look in Joshua chapter number 14, we see where the major battles are pretty much over for the nation of Israel. Now, there are some still some enemies that need to be defeated, and they're going to be driven out by the individual tribes, but the major battles have been taken care of. And so now it's time to divide up the land. Now, on the east side of the Jordan River, you have the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. They are on the eastern portion of the Jordan River. Now, on the western side of the Jordan River is the promised land. It's the land of Canaan. And so the remaining nine and a half tribes have to divide up their land. This is their reward. This is what God had told them. God said, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you this. You have to go in and conquer that and possess that. And then here is your reward. Here's the icing on the cake. Now you get to divide up that land. You've never had a land to call your own. You've never had a place to call your home. You, you've never had a place where you could build homes and raise families and, and say, this is my land. They'd always been sojourners all the way back to the time of Abraham. God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a land. You need to go out and possess it. Didn't tell him where he was going. He told Isaac, going to give you a land. Told Jacob, going to give you a land. Told Moses, here's going to be the land. Told Joshua, here's going to be the land. Finally, they get to that point. All the patience, all the hard work, now they were there and God was ready to give them the land. So they're going to divide the land. Now, as we saw here a couple of weeks ago, Judah's the first one within the tribes uh, in the land of Canaan, in the promised land, to receive inheritance. Judah's kind of the prominent tribe. It's the largest, most powerful tribe. It's the tribe that Caleb came from. Of course, the tribe the Lord Jesus would come from. But if you look in verses in chapter 14, Caleb begins this. He gets a special portion. Now, remember that because the last portion is going to go to Joshua. So it kind of, the bookends are Caleb and Joshua. The two spies that went to the promised land said, hey, we can take this land, we can do it. Just trust God and believe God. And so chapter 15, you see the land is divided up, and Judah gets their portion. That would be the largest area. Now chapter 16, you see the two sons of Joseph, Ephraim, and in chapter 17, Manasseh, they get an another portion there. Joseph gets a double portion. Remember, Levi received no inheritance. So uh, uh, Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, they take that portion, so they get the double portion. Now, you go with me to chapter 18. 
Look at verse number one. Now, I want to read verse number one, chapter 18, because this is going to come into play more as we look at a passage tonight. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there, and the land was subdued before them. Now, Shiloh is the place that becomes the religious center for this time for the nation of Israel. It's in the promised land. It's about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. And it's interesting because the word Shiloh means tranquil. It's where we get our word tranquilizer. It means quiet and peace and calm and rest. And so this is where it would be. Now, you have to come back tonight to get the full story about Shiloh. And so the tabernacle's there at Shiloh. Now, if you look in chapter 18 and verse 11, Benjamin receives his portion. Chapter 19 and verse 1, Simeon. Chapter 19 and verse 10, Zebulun. Cha uh, verse 17, Issachar. Verse 24, Asher. Verse 32, Naphtali. And verse 40, Dan. And then Joshua in verse 49, Joshua receives a special portion. So it, it begins with Caleb and it ends with Joshua in the promised land. And then in chapter 20, there are six cities of refuge. And these are simply cities if someone accidentally or unintentionally killed another person, people could run to these cities and find safety. And they would be, they would be safe there until they received a fair trial. And it would prevent injustice. It would prevent someone from taking revenge upon them. Now, there were three cities on the east of the Jordan, three cities on the west of the Jordan. And these cities were all within about one day journey from anyone in the nation of Israel. Now, chapter 21. These are the 48 Levitical cities, okay? They were, Levi didn't have a particular land area, but they had 48 cities spread out throughout all the tribes, and this was a spiritual presence within the land. Now, for some of you today, you didn't think I could get through six chapters in five minutes, did you? Amen? And listen, I'm not saying those passages are not important, but it just simply gives borders and boundaries of, of, of the land area that they were going to that they would possess. But I want you to see there in the last part of chapter 21, the book of Joshua. And I want to begin reading the last few verses of chapter 21, verse 43. And then we're going to pick up in chapter 22. But in verse 43 of Joshua 21, And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers. And they possessed it and dwelt therein. And the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he sware unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. Notice the last part. All came to pass. You got that? All came to pass. God had gone back all the way in the book of Genesis. He said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a land. Abraham didn't know where he was going. He didn't know the location there, but he had faith, and he walked by faith and not by sight. And God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you a seed. I'm going to give you descendants. And you're going to, have to be a great blessing to the world. Abraham said, God, I'm going to believe you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to have faith in you. And I'm going to walk with you. He told Abraham that. A few years later, Isaac came along. He said, Isaac, I'm going to give you a land. And I'm going to give you descendants that I promised to your father Abraham. And then came Jacob. And he told Jacob the same thing. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you descendancy. That's my promise to you. And then a few years later, here came Moses. Moses was led the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. And God told Moses, Moses, I'm giving you a land that I promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. You can count on my promise. Moses said, I'll trust you, God. I don't know where we're going. I don't know how we're going to get there. I don't know how we're going to do it. But I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to believe you because you're always faithful. And then he told Joshua. Moses died. He said, Joshua, take them into the land. Cross the Jordan River. Take them into the land. It's time for them to go. They wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. They've been in Egyptian bondage 400 years. Now it's time to receive their inheritance. They've been faithful. They've been patient. They've trusted me. Here we go. It's time to go. He told Joshua that. And you look at the last few verses we just read in chapter 21. Let me ask you something. You look at those verses. Let me ask you a question. Was God faithful to his promises? Say amen. amen. Did God keep his promises? Say amen. Did God do exactly what he said he was going to do? God told him, he said, I'm going to drive at your enemies. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to defeat them. All you have to do is trust me and believe me and obey me and have faith in me, and I'll take you to this land. That's exactly what he did. Now, the reason I say that, has God given you promises today? Has God promised, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you? We know that. I've said it many times over the last several weeks. Do we believe that? Do we believe God's not going to leave us or forsake us? It doesn't matter if we're on the mountaintop or if we're in the valley. 
God's going to be there and God's going to be with us. Do we really believe that? Do we believe God's going to remain faithful? Do we believe God's going to keep all of his promises? Do you believe God when you come to him and you repent of your sins? Do you believe God's going to forgive you of all of your sins? Do you believe God's going to save you? Do you believe God's going to cleanse you of your sin and save your soul and give you eternal life and prepare a place in heaven for you? Do you believe that? You know, we've had a lot of deaths in our church lately. But you know what? They believe those promises those people did. They believe their sins were forgiven. They believe they had faith in Christ and they were saved. And they believe that they're going to heaven. You know what? Praise God, they're in heaven today. Amen. And they're there in all of the glory because God kept his promises and God was faithful. And God did exactly what he said he was going to do. Let me tell you something, folks. You can trust an almighty God. Amen. You can trust the mighty hand of God and the powerful hand of God and the sovereign hand of God. And we can trust that daily. Then we get into chapter 22. And the reason I say that is because maybe the people begin to see, hey, this God is faithful. And this God keeps his promises. And this God is always good. And he's always great. And he always does exactly what he says he's going to do. Maybe they learned that from God. Chapter 22 and verse 1. It says, Then Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and said unto them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice and all that I commanded you. You have not left your brother in these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God had given rest unto your brethren as he promised them, Therefore now return ye and get you into your tents and to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of Jordan. That's the east. Verse 5. But take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to cleave unto him, and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. And Joshua blessed them, sent them away, and they went to their tents. Now to the one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given possession in Bashan. But to the other half thereof gave Joshua among their brethren on this side, Jordan, westward. And when Joshua sent them away also into their tents, then he blessed them. And he spake unto them, saying, Return with much riches unto your tents, and with very much cattle, with silver and gold and brass and iron, and very much raiment. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brethren. Verse 9. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh, that's where the tabernacle was, Ark of the Covenant, which is in the land of Canaan to go into the country of Gilead, that's on the east, to the land of their possession, whereof they were possessed according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Now, do you see there why I read those few verses in chapter 21 now? Because it shows that God is faithful to us and God keeps his promises. So maybe the nation of Israel were learning from God. You know, they'd been 40 years in the wilderness, and they had to trust God, and they had to learn God, and this one generation died off. And here comes this other generation up, and they say, hey, we better obey God. We better believe God. We better trust God, and we better know that he's going to do what he's going to do. So we better do that. We better keep our promises. And so they begin to see that, and they begin to realize that. And when it comes to the vision of the land, I think it says a lot about Joshua here. And, you know, you look at this, you say, well, why would these two and a half tribes listen to Joshua? Why would they take his advice? Well, let me tell you something. Joshua was a man of God, and Joshua was their leader. They respected Joshua. They looked up to Joshua. They believed Joshua because Joshua was a man of his word. He was a man of integrity, and most of all, he was a man of God. He had led them through the battles, the conflicts, the victories, the struggles. He had led them through all these things, and now they were trusting him. And so Joshua comes. He could have said, you know what? These two and a half tribes are what we might say borderline believers. You go back, I'm not going to turn there, but Numbers chapter 32. You can read that at your own convenience. You know, they, these two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh, they came to Moses. And they said, Moses, we like this land on the east of the Jordan River. It's not in the promised land, but we like this land. It's good for grazing, good for our cattle and our livestock. He said, we'd like to have this. They said, we'd like to have this land. Moses said, okay, it's conditional. Back in chapter 32 of the book of Numbers, he said, if you go with your brothers, and you go across the Jordan and you fight and you help them conquer this land and possess the land and the promised land, then you can go back and have that land. And they said, we'll do it. We'll be, we'll be glad. We'll keep our wives and our children and our livestock back on the east. And we'll go and fight with our brothers, our Israelite brothers, and help them take their land. We'll do that. We'll be faithful to that. And you know, many times we can say we're going to do something, but we don't always do it. How many ever made a promise and you didn't keep it, don't raise your hand. Because you know what? We'd all raise our hands. Amen? 
Some of you back there pious think, oh, not me. I always keep my promises. You promised to take me out to lunch last Sunday. You didn't do it, did you? Amen? Uh-huh. All right. But the thing about it, we don't always keep our promises. And people make promises to us. Oh, I'll be there tomorrow at 4. Do they show up at 4? They don't show up. Or I'll do this, or I'll do that, and I'll do the other. We don't always keep our promises. But these two and a half tribes, they told Moses, they look, before God, as God is our witness, we'll keep our promise, and we'll go help our brothers take this land. Moses said, when you do that, you can return guiltless, blameless, you can go back to your land. Joshua chapter 1. When Joshua was told by God, it's time to take the children of Israel across the Jordan and take them into the promised land. Remember what Joshua did, chapter 1, verse 12? He spoke to the Reubenites and the Gadites, and he said, look, he said, remember what, Mo, what you told Moses. You're going to go help your brothers and sisters take the promised land. They said, we'll do it. We'll leave our little ones, our wives, our children, and livestock over here, and we'll go help them. You see, it's one thing to say you're going to keep a promise, but it's another thing to actually keep the promise. Are you with me? Say amen. And so we're going to keep that promise. Now, seven long years of warfare, and these, these people, Reubenites, the Gadites, the half-tribe of Manasseh, they had been away from their families, their wives, their children, their, their parents, their businesses, close to seven years. I don't know if they got furloughed and got to go home every now and then. Probably not. But they had been fighting for a land they weren't going to live in. And they were fighting for a people that they weren't going to be with. But these were their brothers and sisters of the Lord. These were their fellow Israelite brothers and sisters. And they said, you know what? We made a promise. We made a promise to Moses, we made a promise to Joshua, and most of all, we made a promise to God that we're going to keep our promise. Do you ever make promises to God? I know people sometimes, and they have a, have a sickness, and they say, well, God, I'll be at church every Sunday now. I want you to take care of me. Or they have a family promise. Well, God, if you, if you help this, through this problem, I'll come to church every Sunday. I'll start serving you. And we almost make this vow to God. But you know what the Bible says? It's better not to take a vow than to take one and not keep it, amen? But you know what? Sometimes God has to get our attention, and God has to do this and that and the other in order to get our attention. But the thing about it, they made a promise before Moses, before Joshua, and to God. And they said, we're going to keep this promise. We've made a promise. We're going to keep this promise. And so if you look there in chapter 22 and verse 1, Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, half-tribe of Manasseh. This is the call. Joshua calls them. Now, he could have been mad at them. He could have been put out with them and angry with them. He said, look, you, you guys are kind of trying to split the nation here. And, you know, I, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. But remember, Joshua was a man of God, a man of integrity, a man of his word. So he calls them. Now, verses 2 and 3, he compliments them. Look what he does there in verse 2. He said to them, you have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice and all that I commanded you. You have not left your brother in these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. There's a compliment. Joshua says, look, you've obeyed Moses, you've obeyed me, and most of all, you've obeyed God. And so you've done everything asked of you. You've been faithful to your promise. You've kept your promise. You've obeyed. Verse number four, Joshua commands the two and a half tribes. Now the Lord your God has given the rest unto your brethren as he promised them. See, Joshua liked to bring up the promises of God because Joshua was a man who walked by experience. And you know, many times, I mentioned in our Sunday school class today, we can learn a lot from older Christians, from more mature Christians, people who have walked with the Lord a long time. They've been through the battles. They've been through the struggles. They have the scars. And we can learn a lot from them. And you see, Joshua, Peter the same way. They had walked with the Lord. And they'd been through the tough times and the difficult times. They'd been on the mountaintop. They'd been in the valley. And they'd been everywhere. And Joshua knew that right there. And, and he says here, he says, God has kept his promise. I've seen him keep his promise in the past. I see him keep his promise in the present. And he's going to keep his promise in the future. Can you say that today, amen? That God's been with you, that God, you can look back and you have a good resume of God, that God's always been faithful. God's never let me down. God's always been there with me. And man, I can move on. And I can face the future with faith and, and, and with belief and with trust. And with hope, because I know God is going to be there for me, and God is going to be there with me. So he said, look, guys, God's given rest to your brethren on the west, nine and a half tribes, just as he promised them. He says, therefore, now you can return and get into your tents, unto the land of your possession, back on the east side of the Jordan, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of Jordan. So he commands them right here. See, he's still leader right here of all the nation of Israel. Now look at verses 5 and 6, or look at verse 5. 
We see Joshua's call. We see his compliment. We see his command. We see his challenge. Look at verse 5. But take diligent heed to do the commandment of the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you. To love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to cleave unto him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Listen, folks. I don't know if you underline your Bible. You need to underline that verse. Amen? You need to highlight that verse. You need to memorize that verse. Because Joshua's concerned right here. He's concerned that these two and a half tribes, they don't divide themselves from the nation. They don't separate themselves from the nation. That they're still unified and they're one nation right here. Because you see, you start to see the beginning of division. And you know what's going to happen later on? Here's an east-west division. There's going to be a north-south division. You're going to have the nation of Israel, ten tribes in the north. And then you're going to have the nation of Judah, the two tribes in the south. And so you begin to see division right here. And, and, and so there's a start of that right there. But, but, but I want you to go back to verse number five. Here's what he did. He says, take diligent heed to do. Not only to hear, but to do. You see, we can hear a lot of things. We can believe a lot of things. But do we live it? Do we do it? Do we practice that? Do we put it into application in our lives and the lives of others? Because, folks, we can know a lot of theology. We can know a lot of scripture. We can know every verse in this book and every verse in that book. But do we apply it to our lives and do we do those things? Do we practice those things? Look at verse 5. Here's the five-fold challenge. First of all, to love the Lord your God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Jesus says this in Mark chapter 12. He says this is what you're to do. Here, here, here's a good formula right here, folks, for successful living. It's not five ways to be rich or five ways to lose weight or five ways to do this or five ways to be prettier. You want five ways to be prettier? I can only do so much. I'm not a miracle worker, amen? But I want you to look there. Look here. First of all, to love the Lord your God. That's what he's saying. I, I want you to remember these things when you go back across the river. I don't want you to forget these. I want you to continue to love the Lord your God. He's the God who's been with us. He's the God who's been faithful. He's the God who has kept his promises. Love the Lord your God. Number two. To walk in all his ways. You know what that means? Follow him 24-7. Follow him Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, every day of the week, every minute of the day, every hour of the day, every week of the year. Follow God. Trust God. Number three. It says to keep his commandments. That means to obey all his commandments. To cleave unto him. That means to stay by his side, to never leave his side, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. And you know what? When I look at those words right there, those are actions. You see that? It says to do. Not only hear, not only believe, but do these things. See, love is an action word. You can say you love, and you can believe you love, but you have to put that into action. You can say, well, God, I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to keep your commandments. I'm going to obey your commandments, but do you really do that? And then we, we say, well, we're going to cleave unto it. Do you walk with him daily? Well, well I'm, I, I need to serve God, and I'm going to serve God. Do you really serve God? And so he's saying here, here's what you need to put into practice. Here's what you need to put into action. You do those things, and everything's going to be fine. Now, why should they listen to Joshua's advice here? Joshua was their leader. Joshua was trusted. He was respected. They believed him. He was a man of God, a man of his word, a man of integrity. So they said, we, we need to believe that. And so Joshua cares about them. He's concerned about them. They've been through a lot together. These two and a half tribes had helped him defeat the Ammonites and, and the Canaanites and all these ites. He, he, they had helped. And now he's sending them away, and he says, I want to send you away with some good advice and with some challenges right here and with some exhortations and encouragements right here. I want you to remember these things. Then he goes in verses 6 and 7. Joshua confirms the two and a half tribes. What does he do? He blesses them. He gives their approval. He gives his confirmation, and he sent them away, and they went unto their tents. And then kind of parenthetical, verse 7. Of course, Moses had given one half of the tribe of Manasseh on the east, Joshua gives them on the west. And when Joshua sent them away also into their tents, then he blessed them. Now, you know what I see in that? When you keep your promises to God, God will bless you. Do you believe that? Say amen. God will bless it. God will bless you. God will honor you. God will bless that work. If you remain faithful and you keep your promises. Now, look at the last two verses. Boy, you didn't think I'd get through seven chapters in this time, did you? Some of you are thinking, well, you're not through yet. Joshua cares for the two and a half tribes. Look at verses 8 and 9. 
And he spake unto them, saying, Return with much riches unto your tents, very much cattle, silver, gold, brass with iron, very much raiment, clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brother and those who have stayed behind to take care of the wives and the children of the home. And you know what I see right there, folks? And I want you to listen to this. When you're obedient to God, God re will reward your faithful obedience and your faithful service. Did you know that? God will reward that. But you know what? We don't just do that in order to have things. We don't serve God in order to have things, material things. We serve God because we want to serve God. Because we're grateful for what he's done for us. We're grateful for who he is. See, it's one thing of what we do for the Lord. But it's another thing, who we are in the Lord. And if we are who we need to be in the Lord, then we'll do for the Lord. And we'll serve him out of gratitude and love and appreciation for what he's done for us. How many of you ever been blessed by God? Say amen. amen. How many of you being blessed by God right now? Say amen. amen. How many of you think God's going to bless you in the future? Say amen. amen. You say, well, preacher, you don't know what I've been through. I've been through a tough time. Hey, we've all been through tough times. But you know what? I've never seen one time God's left that person. Amen. I've never seen one time where God has been unfaithful to that person. I've never seen one time where God says, I will not pour my peace upon that person and my comfort and my encouragement upon that person. I've never seen that one time. God is a God you can count on because God is always faithful. God is always faithful, faithful to his promises, always one who will be there for us and be there with us. And so Joshua says, hey, because of your faithfulness, because of your obedience, you've hung in there. You haven't quit. You haven't surrendered. You're going to have some of the spoils of war. You know, he could have sent them away and said, look, you guys splitting from us. You're going back on the other side of the river. We may never see you again. You know, you came over and fought. Hey, we appreciate that. Now go home. Thanks, but go home. But he said, no, I'm not going to do that. They deserve some of this. They've earned this. They've worked for this. And so they're going to get some of the spoils of the battle. So he sends them away, not empty-handed, but he gives them an honorable discharge. See, they had been faithful to everything God had asked them to do. And so in verse 9, the children of Reuben, children of Gad and half-tribe of Manasseh returned, departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go into the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, whereof they were possessed according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. You know what, folks? They kept their promise. Did you know that? They kept their promise. They could have said back, you know what, we gave that promise to Moses, we gave that promise to Joshua, but when it comes time to keep that promise, we're not going to keep that promise. They could have done that. They could have run, they could have hid, and they could have said, we're not going to go over and fight. We have our land, we have our peace, we're, we're satisfied here. Let them, they're on their own. But you know what, they kept their promise. They kept their promise. And you know what, as I see this today, I'm thankful today that though we go through trials and tribulations and uproars and struggles and heartaches and pains and agony, God always keeps his promises. He's always faithful. How can you stand at the casket of a loved one and say, boy, I hope they made it to heaven. How can you look at someone who's sick, who's going through treatments or, or sick or whatever and say, well, I hope God hears my prayers and I hope God heals you. How can you talk to someone who's going through a marital problem and say, well, I hope God can restore your marriage. Hope God can take care of this. Hope God can bless this church. You know what that's saying? I don't really believe you can. Do you pray with faith? Do you trust God with faith? Do you believe God's promises and God is faithful and God is always faithful to his promises and God's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do? That's what I see in this passage right here. That God is always God. You know, I always love that verse and I've mentioned it several times. I read it at a, at, at a service yesterday. But the psalmist writes in the 46th Psalm and says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes we must do that. And we must realize God is faithful. God will keep his promise. God will do exactly what he said he's going to do. Because if not, our sins are not forgiven. If not, our, our, our souls are not cleansed. If not, there's not a place in heaven for us, prepared for us. If not, we're not going to rule and reign with God forever. That's if God does not keep his promises. But folks, I'll tell you today, the God I serve is a promise-keeping God. The God I serve is a faithful God. The God I serve is a God who can be trusted. 
The God I serve is the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The God who created all things. And the God who says, look, you come unto me. You come unto me, all you that labor and weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That is God's promise to you today. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed today. As we take this time to be still and to know that he is God. Just bow right now where you're sitting. Say, God, thank you for your faithfulness. God, thank you that you keep your promises. God, thank you that you're always there for me. You're always there with me. God, thank you that you never leave me. You never forsake me. God, thank you that I can call upon you anytime, anywhere. And I can talk to you about anything that maybe I can't talk to someone else about. And God, thank you most of all for saving a wretched sinner like me. Folks, if you're here today and you know Christ is your Savior and you're saved, you need to get on your knees and before your bow before God today and say, God, thank you for saving my soul. God, thank you for making me whole. God, thank you for working in my life. Believe God is faithful. Believe he can be trusted. Believe that he is a big God and a powerful God and a mighty God. Do not limit God. Father, I pray today, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts today. Father, there may be here, people here today who have never trusted in Christ as Savior. Maybe they've been saved, but they've never come forward and made it public. Maybe they've never been scripturally baptized, become a part of the church. Father, I pray you'll speak to their hearts today, that they would move, they would do what you would have them to do. Maybe there are people here today who have never trusted in Christ as Savior. Lord, may you convict their hearts today. May you speak to their hearts. May they realize their lost condition, their need of a Savior, that they need to trust Jesus. They need to ask Jesus into their heart and believe that Jesus died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. Maybe there are those here today that have been coming to this church and they're, uh, they're letters of another Baptist church of like faith and practice, and, and, and they need to unite with the fellowship of this church. Maybe there are people here today who need to rededicate, recommit their lives to you. God, move in their hearts today. God, help us to walk away from here today, not with our heads down, not with our heads bowed, not with our our hearts broken, but may we come out of here today rejoicing that there is a God and that you are alive and that there is a risen Savior and that there is a heaven awaiting us and that our sins are forgiven and that no matter what we do, you're not going to run away from us, that you're going to keep your promises, you're going to be faithful to us. And Lord, help us to leave here today with, with rejoicing in our hearts, knowing that you're alive and no matter what elections, no matter what the government says, no matter what happens in our world today, the wars, the conflicts, we know today that God is still on his throne. And no one can dethrone you. Because you say in scripture, I am God. And there is none else. May we realize that today and may we believe that with all of our heart. God, I pray today that you'll move in our midst. That you'll work in our lives. That you'll work in the life of this church. And that we may give you all the honor the praise, and the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What number, Brother Gary? 337. Number 337.